Am I on? I'm on. Oh, good. Good morning. Kingdom. It's important. It's one of those topics that many times churches don't teach. And uh, God's opening up his truths in these days, and we want to know more and more about his kingdom because that's where we live. Like it or not, that's where we live, is in his kingdom. So we're going to continue on today with part two of the kingdom of God. And I know there are some people that weren't here for part one, so I'm going to do a quick review of some of the highlights, main parts that we covered. So if you see some things that are familiar, you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's good. That refreshes your memory. So we'll, we'll start with that. A lot of the material that I'm taking uh, from this is from Miles Monroe's books, and I really appreciated his books um, because they give a little different view of the kingdom from than the traditional uh, view that we see. And so I'm taking that, adding other materials to it, and that's where we are. So the first part is a quote from his book, um, and it's an adaptation of Genesis 1, 1 through 3, and John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the king's word, and his word was himself. He was inseparable from him. His word was with him from the start. Everything that exists came into being through the king's word. No other source of life exists. In his word was life, and this life manifested the knowledge of the king and his kingdom to the darkened and confused minds of humanity. But although the light of this knowledge shines brightly, those who choose to remain in a darkened state cannot see it. In the beginning, the king created a colony for his kingdom. The colony was raw and undeveloped, and there was no life there. The king's governor was poised to bring order and kingdom influence to the colony through the king's word. In the beginning, in creation, the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness. It hovered over that formless void, and it brought order and function to that void. He's in the same process. He hovered over the waters in the beginning, and he's hovering over our waters, and he's bringing form and function to us. We're going to be focusing today on the kingdom of God, meet the governor. In the first day with the kingdom, you meet Jesus. He's our savior. He's the son of the heavenly father, okay, in the kingdom. In the kingdom of God, God is king. Jesus is his son, his representative. They're all one. The Holy Spirit is one with them also. Second day, you get to meet the Holy Spirit. He's the governor. Now, it's not like a state governor. This kind of governor was a governor who uh, had to be, well, we're going to get into more details later, but he had to be from the, a native of the homeland, the, the home country. He had to be ingrained with the culture of that home kingdom. And then he was sent out as a representative of the king. So the Holy Spirit is sent out as a representative of the king of Father God. He speaks and does nothing except what the Father tells him. Does that sound familiar? Uh-huh, just like Jesus. He came and he spoke and did nothing except he heard the Father say it. And what did Jesus do? He says, oh, I'm going to leave. But guess what? I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a governor. A governor went to a colony, and I'm jumping way ahead of myself. Maybe I should pause. But anyway, a governor went to the colony to establish the culture of the home kingdom. That was his job. The Holy Spirit comes into our kingdom, and he establishes the heavenly culture in us first, and then it spreads out here. All right, let's back up just a teeny tad here. So some kingdom concepts that we talked about uh, last time I taught was the king. We've already talked about that. That's the father. And the kingdom. The kingdom is a realm over which the king reigns. It's where he has dominion and he has power. 
There is a parent country. That is where the king, that's his realm. And then he is going to spread his influence to other areas. That's all part of being a kingdom. Those places that he spreads his influence to are colonies. In Miles Monroe's illustration, the kingdom of God is the spiritual heavenly realm which is around us, but then it spreads to the colony of earth. That's the picture he's using. And the influence of the kingdom of heaven then comes to earth. We're to be a picture of that original kingdom. Governor, we talked about that. That's the one that goes and represents the king to make sure that that culture and lifestyle and language and all of those things from the original parent country are reproduced in the colony. Vice governors, they work under the governor. They take instruction from the governor. We're the vice governors. We take instruction from the Holy Spirit. He only tells us things that the Father says to do. We follow his instructions and also help establish the kingdom of God on this earth. Citizens are different than residents. When you are a citizen of the kingdom, well, the way you get to be a citizen of the kingdom is not just merely crossing a border and standing over and saying, okay, now I'm part of the kingdom. No, 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 no. Part of the way you become... Well, the, the only way you become a citizen of the kingdom is by receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then you are a citizen of the kingdom. It is only citizens of the kingdom that have certain rights and privileges. You can't just go and say, okay, I'm living in this territory, therefore you owe me. Uh-uh, that's not the way it works in the kingdom. In the kingdom of God, you have to be a citizen to gain those privileges and responsibilities. The king takes very seriously his citizens, and citizenship is not given lightly in the kingdom. Nice to have a little moisture in your mouth. Um, but the king takes it very seriously. When he has citizens, it is not just like a president or a governor of a state or things, something like that, where they go to office, do their job, go home, hope the people do okay. No, with the king, a good king, he is going to care about his citizens to the point where it, it reflects badly on the king if he does not take care of and pre provide for and protect his citizens. Wow. We're part of the kingdom of God once you're born again. And our king, Father God, takes it very seriously that we are protected and provided for in whatever we need. It will reflect badly on him if we are not. Culture, language, and customs, all of those are things that we have to acquire. We were born into this natural kingdom, the earth, the natural realm. We have picked up all kinds of habits and lifestyles and language and all kinds of things that we do, and they don't line up with the kingdom of heaven. But we're in luck. We are blessed because the Holy Spirit is the one that is sent here as our governor to help teach us to help us acclimate and change into that culture of heaven so that we can work, walk in heaven on the earth. And we talked about, oh, 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 no, we didn't. Uh, qualifications for becoming a king. Well, Jesus said that we were, that he's made us priests and kings to our God. Okay, so we're already a king, but how did that happen? In the natural, how do you get to be a real king? You have to be born to royalty. You have to have that royal bloodline going through your veins. Ah, yes. We have been born of royalty in the spiritual realm. So we qualify to be a king. But you know what? There's gonna, you've got to have a different realm to be king over. Kingdom of God. John the Baptist preached the kingdom of God. Jesus' first sermon was about the kingdom of God. Jesus' disciples and later apostles preached and taught the lifestyle of the kingdom of heaven. 
when we look at a natural kingdom on the earth, it sheds light into how the kingdom of heaven works. So if we understand how the natural realm works, it's kind of a picture. First the natural, then the spiritual gives us a little bit of an insight on how it's done. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous terms. It's the same thing. One just tells who is king, the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven just says where it is. It's in heaven. Not far, far away in a fluffy cloud after you die. No. It is the spiritual realm right here and now. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It is within you. It is now. You do not have to wait until you die to gain the benefits and walk in the benefits of being a citizen of the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to wait. I used to ha think that you had to wait till you had, you know, till you died and was way far away, and then everything would be nice. Wrong, wrong. Step out of the mud right now and step into the kingdom life. You know, shake off that mud. He's teaching us how to do that step by step by step. Born again is mentioned three times in the scriptures, and kingdom of heaven is mentioned 158 times. It doesn't even include all the references that just say kingdom. And what is the church majored on? Being born again. Super important. But it's not all. The Bible emphasizes a whole lot more the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, his reign and rule on the earth beginning with this earth. Adam was made of the earth of the ground. He starts in us. He starts ruling and reigning in us, and then it spreads out from there. So what is a kingdom? We talked about that a little. Kingdom's a territory over which the king has rules. The word of the king, what he says, what he wants, goes. There's no voting. There's no protesting. I want my way, I want my way, I want my way. No, uh -uh. it doesn't work that way. Everything in the kingdom belongs to the king. Lands belong to him. Resources belong to him. And the people belong to him. We belong to him. Once we become citizens, well, he's, he, you belong to him anyway because you were created by him. <laughs> he, he owns us twice. Two reasons, the right of redemption, he redeemed us, he bought us back, and the right of creation, he created us. We're his. Period. And he is king, whether we recognize it or not. Okay? Um, let's see. Okay, so the goal of a kingdom is to increase its territory. You think of a natural kingdom. What did the Roman Empire do? It spread its influence all over the place. And it... Um, lost my face for a sec here. Um, it became... It wanted to spread its territory and its influence, and the colony became a copy of the conquering kingdom. You'll notice that, that colonies that were of England, you go and listen to the people, they've got that accent, that fun accent, you know. And if you ever try to drive in a country like that, um, you're, you know, they're going to be driving on the different side of the road than what we are. Their customs, their food, those different things are going to be different. I, I spoke briefly last time about how when I was uh, years ago, I was able to go to England. And it was a fabulous time. Spent three weeks there. But the one thing that I never caught on to was how to cross the street safely. Because the traffic was going the wrong way, and I was always looking the wrong way, you know? But I did finally find a trick. Catch this. I learned to find a native and stand by the native and cross when the native went across the street. Do you think we could do the same thing with the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a native of the kingdom of God. Why don't we step alongside the Holy Spirit and walk when he walks, stop when he stops, and we'll get across safely? Go with the native. The governor has to be a native of the kingdom before he is sent to help 
change that culture, okay? Holy Spirit is an amazing, amazing thing. So the people in this new territory had to learn the new language, customs of their country. They had a new history and a new way of living. That sounds like Christianity, doesn't it? Yeah. Put off the old man, put, put on the new. Okay. So again, as we said, you have to be born into royalty to become a king. And now those who have him as savior and king are citizens of heaven and able to access the resources not only of just this earth, but of also the, the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual realm. So we have access to both. Jesus spent most of his ministry, whoops, sorry, he's made us kings and priests to our God, and he shall reign on the earth. Revelations 5, 9 through 10. In this manner, therefore, pray, our heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heavens. That's Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Now, if Jesus told them to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, just the same as it is in heaven, were to be a copy of the kingdom of God. I read over that for years. Didn't see that. It's amazing. It's what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. Jesus did not come to establish a religion. He came to establish the kingdom of heaven on the earth. He came for the purpose of restoring humanity to right relationship to the Father King so that the extension of the kingdom of heaven may once again be established on the earth. He came with a purpose. We have a purpose, too, to play in the establishment of the kingdom of God on this earth. So, today, we see that Jesus walked in the power of not only just being natural. He was all man and he was all God. He was tempted in every way as we were. Don't cross out the humanity and say, oh, that was Jesus, that was just him. The Bible says he was tempted in every way as we were, yet without sin. But he was all God also. He had dual citizenship. He had, and we do too. Those who are born again have dual citizenship. You are a citizen of this earth, this natural realm, but you're also a citizen of that heavenly realm, of the kingdom of God. You can access the benefits of this natural realm. You can access the benefits of the spiritual realm now here. He was our example. He's the patterned son. We are to be like him. Follow the pattern. So today we're going to meet the governor. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit a lot more. The Holy Spirit has just been a precious, precious, precious part of my life. Later I'm going to share some of my testimony and some things. Um, amazing, amazing person, the Holy Spirit. He has been such a companion. Every day, companion. Counselor. I talk with him constantly about little things. God, where did I put my keys? <laughs> now, what was that I was going to get in this room? <laughs> Honest. And he helps me. He is so precious. God, that person just gets under my skin. What do I do with him? He'll tell me. He'll show me. Where should I go today? What are we working on today? Follow the anointing. What does he have his fingers on for you for today? You have your plans. I always get up with plans. I have lists. Anybody who knows me knows I make lists. I have a bazillion lists. I, I consolidate them every so often. But I, I love to cross off lists. It's just one of those things. So I put down, okay, this would be awesome if I got all this done today, but I know there's no way I'm going to. But then I just pray in the spirit for a while. And I just, I do it daily. Do it daily. 
Shower is a great time to do it. Either praise him, worship, music, whatever, but pray in the spirit. That means praying in tongues, okay? And you just pray in the spirit and just listen. Just listen. And he'll show you. Oh, okay. We'll do this first and then this. Oh, okay. I can go out and weed. Okay. He knows what's coming. You're preparing the way as you pray in the spirit. And it's amazing what happens. So let's find out about the governor. Okay, so he's... Part of his role is to help transition that, that colony, that newly conquered colony, into uh, being, being a copy of the homeland. Um, so he oversees that. The governor was sent to live in the colony, and the colony made a very, very special place for him. This happens to be in the Bahamas. I was curious because that's where uh, Miles Monroe is from. And uh, he uses a lot of examples from there. So I was curious to see what the governor's mansion looked like. And so that happens to be that one, but I'm sure there's some different ones. And he said that if the country were, was really poor and people weren't doing very well, it didn't matter. The governor's mansion always was a picture of the homeland. Hmm. It was always the best, the always the best. Let me find where I am here. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells within you? For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Did you know you're the governor's mansion? You represent the homeland. At the new birth, he has been fixing you not in the natural. Well, yeah, he works on that. But there has been an instantaneous change in your spirit, which has allowed the governor to move in, the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. You're the mansion. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being changed into that same image of him. Transformed. Hmm. The governor's job is to help transform the colony to be exactly like the homeland. And as we behold him, not the dust and dirt and the garbage that's going around here. As we behold him, eyes on him, third day is all about him. You focus on him. You change from glory to glory into the same image. That was 2 Corinthians 3.18. In 1 John 4.17 it says, As he is, is, so are we in this world world we are vice governors under the guidance of the Holy Spirit the governor then Jesus says it's better that I go I mean here's Jesus he's working all these miracles they're all excited because they're looking for a king that's going to establish an earthly realm an earthly kingdom and he says it's better that I go. I'm not going to be here forever. What? Surely it's better if Jesus was here. Well, he said it. It must be true. Nonetheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Your advantage? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Oh, here's the reason. But if I depart, so I've got to leave... And then I will send him to you. That's John 16, 7. Here's another translation, I believe. Uh, amplified, I think. It is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, now here's an, a descriptor of the Holy Spirit. The comforter. He has comforted me, even at the death of my cat. 
that I was super attached to. He comforted me. I just, it was one of those deep heart things. It just was, you know. I've had people die and death, but somehow I just was so attached to this. And he comforted me. He showed me pictures that just, of him holding her. And I knew she was okay. Her husk, as Johnny Appleseed would say, was here. Her body was here, but I knew she wasn't there. But he had her. So he comforts you. Counselor, oh my goodness, fabulous. Helper, absolutely. Advocate. Do you want anybody to stand up for you? To help you? Be like a lawyer for you? Yeah. Intercessor. Did you know that you, when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, can pray the perfect prayer? You can pray the perfect prayer. You can pray the will of God. You ever wondered what to pray? Oh, God, the situation. Uh, I think we need this, and I think we need this. And God, if you just do this, and you just do that, I think everything would be fine. Well, the problem is we think that. And we're using our brain to do that. Well, God has a way for us to be able to pray his perfect will into the earth through us. And that's by praying in the Spirit. When you know not how to pray as you ought, the Holy Spirit will help you with utterances. Okay? He prays through you with the, in the Holy Spirit in tongues. He's strengthener. Oh, my goodness. Encourager. Oh, yeah. I count on that. Stand by. He's always going to be there. Okay, so it's profitable because if he doesn't go away, all this will not come. There was only one Jesus. He could be in one place physically at a time, and that was it. He had to go away so that this was available for everyone, everywhere, all the time. There was only one Jesus at the, at the beginning there. But now, through the Holy Spirit, he is in everyone who wants it, wants him. But if I go away, I will send him. He's promised. He will send him, and he did. And we saw the manifestation in the scriptures at Pentecost. I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Close fellowship. It's a fabulous relationship, believe me. Fabulous. Fabulous. A friend like you have never had before. Never. The original plan was the kingdom of God on earth. This is uh, my, an excerpt from Miles Monroe's stuff. It says, The original blueprint of the creator was for a kingdom government on earth as an extension and reflection of his own greater spiritual kingdom. This earthly government was to be a thriving colony with humanity, one, as its citizens citizens, not occupants. Two, it's local vice governors representing the home kingdom. Our mandate was to transform the colony, our mandate, was to transform the colony into the nature of the kingdom. You know, he told us to have dominion, to guard the garden, to, to keep this colony. That was our job. The character of the initial, initial kingdom, or colony, excuse me, was both peaceful and productive because of the generous nature of his creator and sovereign. Think of the Garden of Eden, you know? Peaceful, productive. His interests are the welfare, fruitfulness, and fulfillment of his citizens. He is a perfect government, a benevolent ruler. Better than any king. So Eden was the manifestation of the first kingdom on earth. Um, when the Spirit of God came, he gave them authority. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit that gave man his authority and ability to have dominion over the earth. There are two things really important, is authority and ability. You get born again, you get the authority. You're son of the king, absolutely. You get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you have the power and ability to walk out that, that natural, or 
that spiritual realm in the natural. Okay, so we were vice governors over the garden uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So what happened in the garden? It says that they walked with God in the cool of the day. That word cool is ruach, which means spirit, breath of spirit. They walked in the spirit with God. Was that just once a week? I don't see any notation on that. My assumption on that is it probably was daily. Do we walk in the spirit with God daily? Throughout the day? More and more every day? We're growing. We're learning. That's the goal. That was the original plan, that man would walk in such close communion with God, and that is possible through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that he would, he would hear that voice of God and do what he, he said. So the Father King not only gave them dominion, but he gave them instructions. Just like the governor, vice governors are supposed to implement the wishes of the king. They represent him, they speak for him, they're creating a copy of the parent kingdom. So Adam and Eve are doing their thing that they're supposed to be doing. But then something else came in there to disrupt that. Man chose to believe the lie from the serpent, which said that they would be like God if they ate the forbidden fruit. God told them they weren't supposed to. Just follow instructions. Do what the king says. He knows. He sees it all. But why was that a lie? Everybody wants to be like God. Why was it a lie? It was a lie because they were already like God. They were created in his image and likeness from the beginning. And they were deceived into thinking, oh, if I just do this, I'll be like him. They had been made in his image and likeness. They had sinned, rebelled, and rejected the king's rulership. Ooh, in the natural, when a colony declares independence, they are cut off from the parent country. The governor leaves, and the resources are no longer available. The colony of Earth was now officially disconnected from the kingdom of God and its governor, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Miles Monroe talks about how when the Bahamas declared their independence from Great Britain that their governor left. And suddenly all the resources they'd been getting from England dried up, and they were on their own. Man declared his independence from the kingdom of heaven in the fall. Nope, I can handle it. I'll do it myself. I don't need to follow your orders. But I'm going to be just like you. Jesus took care of that. He opened the way through his sacrifice, for a man to become again in right relationship with the Father King in the kingdom of heaven so that that connection may be reestablished. That is done at the new birth. When you are born again, you are now in right relationship with the Father, and that connection is reestablished. Um, man, once again, had communication from the heavenly government. Communication, I find, is a whole lot clearer with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, our entrance, so who's the governor of the Holy Spirit? Our entrance into the kingdom of heaven is also called the new birth. It results in the rest restoration of our legal authority as rulers on the earth. Then our baptism in the Holy Spirit results in the restoration of our power or ability to carry out that authority. If I had a principal when I was teaching in the schools who did not back me, I had the authority to do this stuff. I was mandated to do whatever I was supposed to do, but if they didn't back me, I didn't have the power. Guess who's backing us? All the power of the kingdom of heaven. Understanding these two concepts will enable us to 
be effective as we live out the culture of the kingdom on the earth, for both have to do with the reinstatement of the governor to his place and role in the lives of human beings. We receive the person of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit in the baptism. We need the person of the Holy Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven, but we need the baptism of the Spirit to live victoriously in the earth. Anybody want victory? Mm -hmm. I like victory now. I like victory in every area of my life. Does that mean it's perfect? No, but we're getting there. We're getting better. Here's the new birth. The new birth is pictured as a, a well of water. Water is uh, something that is used to, to illustrate the Holy Spirit. What baptism of the Holy Spirit is like a flowing river. There's a whole lot more power there. I like that. <laughs> I like both, but I like... I like living victoriously. I, I think that's awesome. The word is dunamis, and that is the kind of word we get dynamite from. It's power. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, take it the next step. So there's day one, there's day two. That flowing, powerful river is down payment of what he's about to release in this third day. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. If you've walked with the Holy Spirit much at all and you go, whoa, that's down payment? Oh my gosh. What is that fullness of maturity going to release? Holy cow. This is awesome. It's awesome. So, Holy Spirit is the third part of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one, but they have different functions. Holy Spirit's not a thing or a spooky, spooky ghost. He's not a dove, though he did come in the form of a dove. He's not fire, but he is illustrated as that in the cloud and so on. Um, we explain his attributes. He's a person. He can be grieved. Um, his job is to extend to a person or situation what is needed so that the kingdom of God can be established in their life, whatever is needed. He's the power to make that happen. He's the most sensitive person of the Trinity. He's a counselor, comforter, guide, teacher, helper, enabler. He helps you fulfill your purpose in the kingdom. He re reconnects you to your gifts that God's put in you. By the way, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. is not It's one gift. It's the Holy Spirit. He has everything. If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have everything. You don't have to worry about what gifts you're going to have. It'll be whatever is needed at that time. They're just manifestations of the same person. Okay? So a lot of people say gifts of the Spirit, and I wanted to clarify that. Um, he convicts. You have sin. He's not the condemner. If you feel condemned, that is not him. He will convict you. Um, he draws people to God. He's a communicator. He's a sanctifier. The character, now we've been made kings and priests. The character of the king determines the state of the kingdom. You can see that in the Old Testament, where the, um, the kings that were godly, that people prospered and did well, those who were not... Ugh, things did not go well. So the Holy Spirit is helping us with our culture. We have the fruit. Okay, so we have to look at the culture of our internal kingdom. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of the king. It's not only what the king does, but it is who he is. Okay, we're kings too, so we get to check this off too. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That's why he's working within us first to establish those character traits within us because it's the character of the Spirit, the character of our King of our kingdom 
being transferred to us, being birthed in us, that's going to make a difference. It actually protects you and protects the use of the gifts of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit becomes a manifestation of the kingdom of heaven on earth. The baptism is the power. You need both. So the manifestations of the Spirit is the ability of the king. You can speak the words of the king. You can transfer the power of the king. You can have insight from the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is the character of the king. And you need both. You need both. Uh, character protects the use of power. Yeah. All right. So fruit doesn't appear overnight. It develops over time. We've got to cultivate, cultivate that culture of the king by the leading of the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is just listen to him and do what he says. It works. Don't have to be perfect at it either, which is pretty cool. Your seed is inside you. You have been impregnated with that divine seed of his spirit, of his word. Let it grow. Put it in conditions where it will grow. We need spiritual food. With my gardens, I need to put fertilizer. I need to put nutrients on the ground to make it grow better. I can even tell almost overnight when I put that on. It's like, woo, green today, really deep green. If I forget to water it, hmm, forget to get in the word, yeah, it's going to dry, and it's still not going to come to fruition. But the seed is in there. You give it conditions, it will grow. A tree does not have to work at making fruit. Ooh, I'm going to make an apple today. Mm, no, it doesn't do that. We're in a day of rest. It does what's natural. That seed has what it needs within it. You have to just provide the conditions and the cooperation for it to grow. Oh, yeah. Miles Monroe says, Worship protects us from establishing our own kingdoms on the earth rather than the heavenly governments because we acknowledge and confirm to him that his desires and will are paramount. We affirm that his government's interests are the ultimate reason for our existence. It's pretty exciting when God starts to, to manifest himself through you. It is exciting. But if you keep your eyes on him, he'll help you stay in line. He wouldn't give it to you if it wasn't good. The governor, the Holy Spirit, is going to communicate to you in mainly two ways. One, he's going to give you that internal warning system. Your conscience is going to tell you. He's also going to bring those things to your remembrance that are in the Word. It's another reason why it's really important to get in the Word. It's only a changed nature that enables us to be retrained to the mindset of the King, not just come into agreement intellectually, but to think his thoughts and manifest his character and nature in our words and deeds. He speaks to you in many ways. He can speak to you through other Christians, people, situations. Um, for me, he tends to speak to me in dreams a lot. Sometimes he'll give me dreams. Um, one that I tend to have frequently in different forms is of a garden. And sometimes the garden has weeds. Ooh, get those weeds out. Okay, it's speaking of my life. Sometimes weeds are all gone, beautiful little plants growing. They're little. Something new has started. Then I'll see other times where it's just plush. I'll see times where he's, they're just so much that there's enough for everybody. I'll see times where the ground is a little dry. Hmm, better get back in the word. Need to spend more time with him. I'll have times where he'll tell me, Change the flow of the water. It's going this way. Now make it go this way. And I listen. There's a change in the spirit. What does he want to do a little bit differently right now? So pay attention to those two. They're kind of fun. All righty. So. Okay. Um, Although we live on earth, we are also seated in the heavenly realms with the king who has brought us to live in his heavenly kingdom. We have all the resources of this kingdom to enable us to live out the culture of the kingdom on earth. They enable the citizens of the kingdom to take on the nature of the king and use the power of the kingdom of heaven to transform the earth. 
into the image of heaven. The manifestations of the Spirit are the delegation and distribution of powers by the governor or the Holy Spirit to the kingdom citizens in order to execute government business in the colony. It's not just to make you look cool and hot shot. It's for the business of the kingdom. It's to help others as well as you. It's both. They are for the purpose of impacting the earthly environment. When the king's son was on earth, he healed people, cast out demons, did miracles, and even turned water into wine to help the host of a wedding. He did practical works on the earth. But they were supernatural. They were naturally supernatural. He was out solving people's problems through the power of of the governor. Hear that. He was out solving other people's problems through the power of the Holy Spirit. Especially when you have the Spirit of God in you at the new birth. Don't you want to help people? Don't you look at people and go, God, I wish I could help them. In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have that power. You just learn to walk with Him, learn to hear His voice, learn to be obedient. And sometimes it's comfortable, sometimes it's not. But it's all God, and it's awesome. He gets the glory. Um, and this work continues through his, continues in our lives today through the Holy Spirit. So, life with the governor. Now you get to hear some of my stories. Practical examples. Anybody want practical? God is practical. He's extremely practical. He's in today. I was amazed. Um, Yonji Cho pastor of the largest church, I believe, in South Korea. So strong in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And um, he talks about his beginnings in poverty and his beginnings hearing God and, and so on. And he ends up with the largest church over there. And when people come and they have a problem, they send them to Prayer Mountain. They put them in... There's small little cubicles built into the mountain, and they go in there by themselves, and they go pray in the Spirit and get with God until they get a solution. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Um, powerful, powerful stuff. And he says, it's amazing what the Western church has been able to accomplish without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's the power. We've been able to do a lot without it, but with it, oh my goodness, he will get into here. He will help you in so many ways. Health, healing. Yes, there's supernatural healing. I have experienced that. Um, there are miraculous healings, meaning you're, you're healing faster than you normally would. Um, I've had wisdom and treatment from doctors, but I also listen to the Holy Spirit. There was a time he told me, yes, go to this doctor and do what he says. Okay. Something totally new that I had no idea that I was supposed to, you know, I didn't know where to go for this problem. And he did. He will also tell me things like, see if these sound familiar. Does he, is he talking to you like this? You need more exercise. After I had surgery, I had abnormal surgery, and I just got so tired of lying still. I just, oh, and I wanted to stretch my legs. And so I would gently just stretch my legs, which would put stress on my abdomen, which was not what I was supposed to do. And finally, he says, quit tearing apart what I'm knitting together. <laughs> it's like, okay. So I quit stretching, and uh, it was good. He tells me things like, you need to eat more of this. Or he'll say, you know, I'll go to him and it's like, God, I'm having this problem. He says, um, you've been eating a lot of sweets lately. Practical. Really practical. There's your problem, girl. Right there. You've been eating too much of it. Okay, fine. Um, he'll point out books and people and so on where I can gain information. Um, and it's just what I need. And it's something as natural and practical, but it's supernatural in that he has pointed it out. Relationships. Think he cares about relationships? Absolutely. Can he be practical? Absolutely. Learn to tune in. Um, a lot of times I'll be in conversation with somebody and, and I want to just butt right in and say this and this in my mind and what I think ought to be done. And, and he says, just listen. But God, I, just listen. <sighs> okay. 
and I'll listen. Um, sometimes there'll be a situation or something I want to get involved in. He says, eh, leave it alone. I'll take care of it. I got this one. I love it when he says, I've got this one. But God, don't you see this? They really need this, and they really need this, and they need I've got this one. There are times when he would tell me, hold your boundaries in this one. Hold your boundaries. He's, he just, he will, he's your coach. He's your coach to help you in all that stuff. Finances. Um, of course, you've got the, the biblical instructions for tithe. And then you can give first fruits, offerings, whatever. Um, tithe is foundational for blessings, but he wants to get into blessings for you too. Um, cars, okay? Would you like to have instructions on buying cars? Yes. I want it from the beginning. Um, when I was, I think I was just out of college, needed a car, never gotten a car. My parents blessed me in allowing me to, to earn my first car. I had access to cars I could drive, but I got to earn my first car. And I wanted to pay cash. You know? I just did. You know, fresh out of college. Have my little bitsy money, you know? <laughs> and my brother, who also is a Christian, happened to be downtown one time. And he walked and he says, that's Janine's car. God will use other people. So I went down and like, yeah, that looks fine. That's perfect. And it turned out to be a very, very good car with good ratings. It lasted a very long time. And then I passed it on. So I needed another car. And by then, I had grown in my walk with God where I had learned that you need to make your request known. So I said, God, you know, I need a new car. I feel like you're telling me it's the season for me to get a new car. And that was the key, too. Is it the season? Is it the time? And then I said, you know, what I would really like, you said to make your wishes known, and so what I'd really like is I need, I would like to have this thing in it, and 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 that, that's what I'm looking for. Would you please guide me? So as we went around, we found them eventually, and this is my single days, and I looked at these two cars, they looked identical, both blue, you know, just identical cars, bumpers were a little different, and I just... I thought, I think this is it. I looked, does it have this? Does it have this? Does it have this? Does it have this? Yes, it did. And I said, oh, and it had that? And that? And that? Whoa, this is cool. This is way more than I ever asked for. Sure, I think so. Check the price. Yep, I can do it. Want to pay cash. So I went in and deal, and they, it, was, it was up here, and I wanted to be here. And God worked it so that it was right, really close. And it took just a little bit of, and I said, God, you know, my request was that I'd pay cash for this thing and I wouldn't owe anything, have to take out a loan or anything. And he says, um, it's okay. So I went on and sure enough, situations worked to where it fit right within it and I was able to pay cash. It again was one that had, God knows the background of cars. Did you know that? <laughs> he knows what they've been through. He knows the good ones. He knows the ones that are going to be dependable. And let him show you. That was an extremely dependable car that I kept for years and years and years and years. And then it came time for close to retirement. I thought it's time to change in again. Okay, what am I looking for? And I da 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 da. And what's the price frame? And la 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 la. And I still was a little confused. Everywhere I looked, it wasn't quite what I was looking for. It just didn't feel right. You'll get a witness. The Holy Spirit will give you a witness. And if it just doesn't, mm, just doesn't settle right, you know it's probably not it. So I looked, and, but then he gave me a picture. I saw a back hatch open, and I saw the back. That's all. I thought, okay. So as we walked around, we looked at different ones, and this one, I thought, oh, that's just too fancy for me. I don't know. But we opened the back hatch, and that was the picture I saw. I said, well, this must be it, and that's the car I have today. So he will help you with all kinds of things. When we bought our house, when we first got married, we again were looking for certain things, and we decided this was the house that we were going to try to buy. And uh, it had a price here, 
and we wanted to, we never had dickered on a house before, nothing. And so we wondered about that, and I heard, don't offer less than X number of dollars. Okay. So they came in with this price. We talked to our realtor, and we said, we'd like to offer this, and that was the exact number that God had given me. And he says, well, I don't know. I don't know if they'll take it or not. But I'll check. I'll ask them. So he asked them, and they took it. First time. No negotiating. Boom. Done. The Holy Spirit is extremely practical in everyday life. He'll tell you when to sell things. Um, another one on money. It isn't always in. Sometimes it's out. I had just been to the um, bank gotten some money out, several hundred dollars. And I went to the grocery store and I saw one of the guys that worked there and I happened to know that his wife had all kinds of physical issues and they had hospital bills and it was pretty overwhelming and I thought on a grocery clerk's salary, wow. And, uh, but I just, I was busy, ready to check out and I'll be darned, this guy was here and I do oh, mm. And uh, God says, give him the money. Given, given the money. How much? All of it. But God, you know how much I got out of the bank? He said, all of it. <sighs> I haven't told Ernie yet. <laughs> okay. So I went up to him and I said, I feel like the Lord wants me to give this to you. And he started crying. And uh, he says, the Lord has just been blessing us with people, just coming up and giving us money. And I gave it to him, and I don't know if we prayed or not, but I got totally blessed, and we were just having a revival service right there. <laughs> Holy Spirit was in the middle of all that. And little did I know that that act of obedience would open the door in another area that I needed opened in my life. Wow. I didn't ask for it. I just was obedient. you got to tune in. He'll help you with recreation. I always pray about where we should go for vacation and when. Um, I worked in offices. Some of you know some of this background. Some of you don't. Um, I worked in offices for many years. And um, let me see. Where am I? Ah, there we go. We'll back up just a tad. Okay, now we'll go. There we go. That's the one we're going. Okay, so some of my, my uh, times with the Holy Spirit, the governor. I worked in offices for quite a few years. God's put the teaching in me, as I've told you, from the time I was little, probably from before I was born, because um, I decided at first grade when people would ask me what I was going to be, I was going to be a teacher. And it was always a teacher, different kinds, but it was always a teacher. And uh, I, I trained for it got good recommendations and so on, and the market was flooded when I graduated. And didn't have a car at that time, so I said, okay. I worked in offices. Gave me great background. It is not a detour. It's all part of his plan. You need that. And just trust him. So I, I worked in offices for several years and actually got to the place where I was comfortable. I thought, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. This is fine. I've gotten used to working my summers. <laughs> And this is okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And suddenly he woke me up in the middle of the night in my apartment, single, and he put the idea, just dropped the idea of going back into teaching into me. Startled me, scared me. But, but I've been out three years. They're not going to want me now. I won't be current. It's not fresh. God, I don't remember my classes. You know, <laughs> and it wouldn't go away. It just wouldn't go away. So I, um, I thought, well, okay. So I checked with the district. And I put in a, an application, finally got the paperwork and everything I needed. And that was in February of that year. And by July, I was teaching. They had started year-round school and needed a fourth more teachers. And actually, when I got done with that particular interview, I did a couple interviews, 
and they just didn't feel quite right. And I got done with this one interview, and God had given me words. I didn't realize it till later, but he gave me words to say that caught the attention of the principal. I walked out of there, and I thought, I think I have the job. Sure enough, day or two later, I got a call. Would you like this job? And I was there for many, many, many years. So he will change that. So when I was at school, they, I, you know, I would have done it for, for no money, except I needed money to live. I loved it so much. It was just fun. And I would tend to stay after school to do a lot of my work. And I would just do a lot of stuff. So I got to know the custodial staff really well. And lots of nice people. But this one guy in particular, I'll call him Joe, uh, would come through. I think he had a Catholic background, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he even went to church at that point. And uh, I had freshly been baptized in the Holy Spirit the year before. I tried teaching on my own power, just being a born-again Christian for one year. Ugh, horrible. I did not enjoy it. But then I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and learned how to flow with him. Fabulous. Oh, my gosh, what a, what a walk. And so I was... I'd, I'd just talk to him. We'd talk about the Bible. We'd talk about being born again. And, well, he didn't know about that. And uh, he wasn't too sure. And then there's one day, he'd just kind of <laughs> laugh and just kind of go on his way. We'd talk. And then one day, I felt like I was supposed to tell him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I did. And he's like, oh, you're kidding. No way. Tongues. Ew, you know, he just he wasn't into that. I said, oh, yeah, and I started to explain to him. And then I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, you need to pray in the Spirit for him. Are you kidding? God, this is a school. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, he was sure. So I said, Joe, I feel like I'm supposed to pray in the Spirit for you. Can I do that? Yeah, sure. I said, give me your hands. So I took his hands, closed my eyes tightly, and prayed in the spirit out loud. And I'd never done that in front of people before. And he, I just, so the night, I didn't feel a thing, you know, but I'm just going like this. And I opened my eyes, and his eyes were this big. He says, what did you do? It was electricity going through your hands. What did you do? He left. <laughs> but within a very few days, maybe a week, he came back. He says, you know, you were talking to me about that born-again stuff. Well, I asked God, and he came into my heart, and I got born again. Oh, yes. Tongues were a sign for the unbeliever. And God used it as a sign to get his attention. He was amazing, just amazing. I've had times where a, a child was choking in my class, and God told me there was nothing I could see. The kid just had his mouth open, just a surprised look, came up to me like this. And God told me, he's choking, use the Heimlich. I didn't question. I whipped the kid around, started doing the Heimlich, and then just wondered, is he really choking? <laughs> I, thought, I thought, well, you better tell me if he's not, because I'm going to go for it. And sure enough, something popped out. Practical. The Holy Spirit is practical. He wants to solve people's problems. I've been in situations where I've been disciplining children and talking to them. And um, one time I found I couldn't figure out what was going on with this child. And I was like, I was frustrated. And I said, what's going, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And, he, and the kid was just clammed up, wouldn't say anything. And, just, nah, nah, nah. and I thought, okay, okay, back off. And then I found the words just flowing out of my mouth. Did not think of them at all. They just flowed out. The Holy Spirit. I said, are the kids picking on you? <laughs> yes. And he started crying. And then we could deal with the situation. Everyday life, if you're open to it. I was disciplining a, another child in another situation. And, and I was talking real strongly to him. And then pretty soon I heard the Spirit say, that's enough. We had gotten to where we needed to and stop before you break him. So I stopped. And then I was able to be that comforter for him. And we made great progress together. It was awesome. 
When you find out where the anointing is in your day, in your life, in your walk, it takes the stress out of life. A lot of stress out. I won't say everything, but a lot of stress out. God, what would you have me do today? Now, I'm not going to sit back and be dumb. He already knows the lists I've done. Okay, what's the project for today? What should I start on? Oh, okay, this, this, this. I've had it in timing. I've had it in driving where he'll tell me, go this route or this route. And suddenly it's like, but God, this one's quicker and shorter. I chose to do it my way. And there was a traffic accident that had happened to block the, the road. Oh. So then I, I you know, asked for forgiveness. Sorry, God, I didn't listen to you. I'm sorry. We'll do better next time. You may not hit it every time, but you get there. It, um, he will tell you how to pray for people, for healings and all kinds of things. Uh, there was a heart condition of a, of a gentleman, and he gave... Uh, God gave me a scripture to use. I used the scripture. He had been to the doctors, going to need all kinds of stuff. Because I prayed the way the Holy Spirit showed me, the man went back to the doctor, and he did not have that condition anymore. He wasn't going to need that special treatment they needed. I had a neighbor who was Presbyterian retired minister. Sweet guy. Loved him. Loved him and his wife. And we'd go over and talk, and we'd pray for one another. And he just happened to mention that he had this something on his leg, and it was pretty big, you know, and it was a cancerous growth on his leg, and uh, he was going to have to go in and get it taken care of. He was rather reluctant about it and all, and uh, I could just sense the Holy Spirit saying, pray for him. I said, okay. I said, can I pray for you? He said, yeah. So Ernie and I both prayed for him, and I followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, and he said, encapsulate that. So I prayed, and I told that thing to encapsulate and to fall off. Now, do you do that every time? No. It's what does the Holy Spirit tell you right then? I did it, and within a week or so, he came back, or well, next time we saw him, he says, Hey, you remember that thing on my leg? He says, Yeah. It encapsulated and fell off. <laughs> so I don't have to have it taken off. And I said, Praise God. So he was really cool. So we are supposed to be functioning in both plans, um, both realms of the kingdom. Can we just have some soft music, Travis, just for a little bit? In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was upon people because they didn't have the new birth to make that governor's mansion for the Holy Spirit to be able to dwell within us. It came upon us, them temporarily, for a season, for a purpose. But with us in the New Testament, after the new birth, the Holy Spirit can come in to dwell within you all the time. Not just that, that well of water, but it can be a flowing river. You can have access to the power, not just the authority of the kingdom of heaven for this day in this realm. Jesus was and told the church to be born of the Spirit. He also told us to be, and he was, filled with the Spirit. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and he tells us to be. He was led of the Spirit, and he tells us to be. He was sealed by the Spirit, and so are we. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. He promised it for us. It's a gift. You will be endued with power from on, uh, on high. It's a distinct experience and subsequent to salvation, though it can happen at the same time. Many times the laying on of hands will help that process. And tongues comes with it. It's like a pair of shoes. It just comes with it. Why not have that perfect communication with heaven? Why not allow the Holy Spirit of God to pray that perfect will of God through you? Can we all stand? Now, I understand that many of you have already received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
I understand that many of you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking of tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance. But I think I would be very remiss and I think I would grieve the Spirit if I did not give you an opportunity for anyone who maybe has not received the fullness of the Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking of other tongues. And I want to give you that opportunity now. Now, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we can take care of that too. He is such an amazing companion. Amazing companion. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, which I have said to you. The word came to life when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I read the word from a child. I understood somewhat. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it opened up as it has never opened up before. It is totally incredible. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. That's talking about you'll be a witness. You will be an example of the kingdom of heaven on earth in your home, in your workplace, in your city. Wherever you go, you will be an atmosphere changer. So if you would like to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and or to be born again, all we have to do, oops, sorry, is ask. The only qualification is that you're a citizen of the kingdom, that you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. For the scripture says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to ask him. So if that's you, that you would like to have that fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, I'm going to ask you to come up front. We have, I'll be praying for you and some other people will be praying for you. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's the one that does the work. A whole new world is opening up. I'm going to ask those of you, especially who have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, would you reach your hand out towards them and just pray in your tongues real softly, just real softly. We're praying the will of God. We're praying the will of God to them in their lives. 